people often ask me uh, how and why I became a writer. The easy answer is that I realized early on that writing was the only thing I really loved doing, in which I could do reasonably well. At some point, I fancied myself becoming a scientist and even entered UP as an engineering major. And that's me, the Philippine Science High School 50 years ago, boring people to tears, which I hope not to do today. <laughs> but I couldn't hack the math. In any case, I found words to be more fun than numbers, and so I resigned myself to becoming a writer for life in all senses of writing. As a journalist, a playwright, a scriptwriter, a fictionist, a poet, and an essayist. I do all these things not because I'm brilliant, but because I write for a living. Some people live to write, I write to live. Even so, people who've never earned a peso from their writing, and probably never will, still love to write, devoting hours, if not months, of passion to poems and stories that very few people, if ever, will get to read. Why do they do that? Writers have offered all kinds of reasons why they write. George Orwell, who's 1984, has suddenly become relevant again in these Trump and Talk Hong challenged times, famously said that writers write for four reasons. Sheer egoism, aesthetic enthusiasm, historical impulse, and political purpose. Sure, some of us write to be famous or to change or make history, but it was the Nobel Prize winner, Toni Morrison, who I think gave the simplest and most honest reason why we writers write, when she said, I wrote my first novel because I wanted to read it. In other words, we write, first of all, not because we want to amuse and to please ourselves. And that's just logical, because if you can't enjoy your own work, how can you expect others to do so? But clearly, many writers don't just write for themselves. We have something to share with others, ideas, emotions, reactions, predictions, our sense of the world and what it should be. Shamelessly, we share our most private feelings with complete strangers, such as when Pablo Neruda says in a poem, so I wait for you like a lonely house till you will see me again and live in me. Till then, my windows ache. And when we share our loneliness with the world, somehow we and the world can feel much less lonely. Another way of answering why we write is to raise the next question. What do you need to become a writer? Let me toss out a few ideas. First, a love of words, a fascination with their origins, meanings, and uses. I don't mean that you should be a walking dictionary or thesaurus, just someone who's naturally interested in the names of things and who has a mental or even a literal notebook where you can store these words. As an adolescent growing up in Pasig, I used to spend an hour or two after school at the Rizal Provincial Library, where I would flip idly through the pages of the big fat Webster's Dictionary, picking up words I would never use. Words like fennec, a North African fox. But words I didn't mind meeting. It gave me a sense of a world much larger than myself, which I looked forward to exploring on my own two feet. Second, a love of books and reading. There's no other or better way you can learn about words and how they behave except by reading. I was a reader before I became a writer. And I read everything. The Hardy Boys, history books, science books, maps, Time Magazine, Li Wai Wai. Third, an insatiable curiosity about the world and the way things work. We can't get everything by direct experience, but we can read up on woodworking, jewelry, macrame, gardening, automotive mechanics in New Zealand. In other words, things we may not be too interested in ourselves or think about on ordinary days. Instead of pondering grand abstractions like love, justice, and freedom, you should cultivate a sense of the materiality of things. Fourth, an empathy for people, a sense of how they think, feel, and act, and a keen understanding of the workings of human relationships. It all comes down to people and their motivations, 
or why we people do what we do. Fifth, a sense of narrative, a desire and the ability to imagine what happened or may have happened. The philosopher Susan Langer once described man as the sense-making animal, suggesting that we got ahead of the other species because of our ability to connect the dots. For example, if we drive large prey over the cliff, they'll fall to their deaths and we'll have food for a week. Narrative and storytelling are basic survival tools. Sixth, a faith in art, in my case, the art of fiction, and in its ability to deal with the most complicated human issues and concerns. Unlike science, art is not fact-based but truth-based, and often life's truths can be established not by reason, but by imagination and intuition. And this leads me to our next question, which is, why should we read? Why bother with books and literature when it seems we can get everything we need on Google and Wikipedia? To begin with, we're often told that, like the other arts, literature is what makes us human. But what exactly does that mean? How does literature humanize us? Literature relies on language, and other animals possess and command a form of language too. Whales, monkeys, elephants, birds communicate, presumably for the most basic things. Food, sex, danger. We might even call their most basic utterances words and phrases of a kind, performing a clear and practical function. They form sequences of meaning like saying, there is food down there, or I want to make a little baby with you. Now, this is language, but it's not literature as we know literature. And why not? Because literature requires imagination, dreaming of things beyond the immediate and the practical. And furthermore, a medium of transmission and preservation of the products of that imagination. We're told that animals can dream, but they can't record and communicate those dreams like we do. Literature is our waking dream, a dream we describe and share through words. These dreams, these stories we make up in our minds can teach, can delight, can disturb, can enrage, can exalt. They can remember and can therefore preserve our memories, our thoughts and feelings as individuals and as a race. And as far as I know, no other species, nothing and no one else can do this. Literature makes us human because it allows us to tell stories that make sense of our lives, even stories that never happened except in our imaginations, which also makes belief in things like paradise possible. Without literature, we cannot acknowledge and even talk about our inner selves, our inner lives. There's some, that's something math or physics can't do, at least not in the way of a poet or a novelist. The appreciation of beauty belongs to this realm of the imaginary, the recognition of pleasing and meaningful patterns in the seemingly abstract, as in this poem by the Brazilian poet Augusto de Campos. The magic of literature lies in how it deals with the reality and reason through fantasy and the imagination, and approaches truth through make-believe, or what we might call the artistic lie. Literature makes use of things that don't exist or things that never happened to talk about things that do, because reality is often too painful to confront directly. As one of my own teachers put it, art or literature is the mirror of Perseus. That's because if you recall the story of the Gorgons, Perseus could kill Medusa, whose fatal gaze would have turned him to stone, only by using his shield as a mirror. Literature is that shield. By deflecting our gaze and seeming to look at other people, we are able to see the truth about ourselves in all its harshness and unpleasantness. Now at this point, I'm going to backtrack a bit so I can go deeper into another basic argument of why we need to read. The point is no longer just to say that reading or literature makes us human. Rather, 
literature makes us better humans by teaching us discernment and critical judgment. Literature is a history of the words that have made sense of our lives. Like the Bible or the Iliad or the Noli and Fili, it shows us at our best and worst so we can choose how we want to live, whether as individuals or as citizens or as a society. To do that, to help us both, to help us use both our reason and our imagination, literature uses language and language uses words. Through carefully crafted stories, poems, and essays, literature shows, that, shows readers that words are supremely important in becoming a better person. And this is especially true at a time when words like friend have been devalued by Facebook, which is why I'm not on Facebook, <laughs> and hero by those to whom history and honor and honesty, especially in public service, no longer mean anything. Remember, we are in the age of fake news, post-truths, and alternative facts. Every entry and every post my students make on Facebook and on Twitter is a test of how well they have learned their language and their literature. And I don't mean their grammar. I'm talking about their sensibility, the way they think and express themselves, the way they deal with other people, especially holding, people holding an adversarial position. How careful are they with their ideas and with their choice of, work, choice of words? And it isn't so much they as we, we teachers, who are being tested. How well have we taught them? How deeply have we drawn on the wealth of human experience in literature to impress upon them that life is full of difficult choices and decisions, of hard struggles to be fought and won? To a generation of millennials weaned on instant gratification, and on tweeting before thinking, like some people we know, the complexity of life can be a profound discovery. This is the first and most important lesson of all literature. Words have meaning. And because they have meaning, words have power. And words have consequences. Words can hurt. Words can kill. But words can also heal. Words can save. Words make law. Words make war. Words make money. Words make peace. Words make nations. Words are the songs we sing to our loved and lost ones. Words are the prayers we lift up to the skies. Words are the deepest secrets we confess. Words are what we tell our children the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night. Words are all that some of us, especially those of us who call ourselves writers, will leave behind. 700 years ago, a Persian poet named Hafez wrote a short but wonderful poem. Even after all this time, the sun never says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights up the whole sky. And this, my friends, is why I write and why you read. We light up the sky of our minds with love, the love of ideas, of our engagement with ourselves and with the world. Maraming salamat po.